They do have a board meeting today, and I'll, I'll go to that meeting, hopefully give y'all some updates on what's going on with their ministry and the need and how we best can help. Do we have any other announcements? I feel like I'm forgetting something. Well, I'm glad you're here at the Lord's house today. This is building uh, with functional heat, beautiful stained glasses. Uh, but I'm glad you're here to worship God, to fellowship together, and to put our minds uh, on Him, and set our, our gaze upon Him. May this moment of worship be not about our cares, not about our concerns, but about Him. And I think we've got a, a song about how He loves us. All rise for how he loves us. Uh, the words are up here and they'll be on the screen. <coughs>
So there may not be any brain function. Uh, so be in prayer for the Cook family as uh, they're in this uh, horrible situation. Uh, do we have any other prayer concerns that y'all would like to voice today? Be in prayer for our community. Uh, be in prayer for revival. Oh, I'm sorry, Martha. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Definitely pray for Bruce. Bruce is having good days and bad days. Uh, he's not able really to get around a whole lot. Uh, it, was, it was this week that y'all came by and he stayed in the car while you came in, right? So, uh, you know, he's, he's used to going around by himself and going to the store and stopping by the church office. And, but that, he's not able to do that. Uh, Martha says it's the big, uh, I guess the big step this week is he's able to stand at the stove and cook eggs. Is that right? One day. One day. That's sad. He's, he's pretty much confined to his chair a good bit. Um, pray that these different visits to the neurologists, cardiologists, all these different visits will maybe yield some answers, maybe some improvement of life. <coughs> Definitely pray for the, the Kincaid family. And again, as mentioned, pray for our community, pray for revival. We need it. We need it. Uh, one of the things we mentioned, church council has uh, been in contact with some of the area churches, especially about Easter about Lent, uh, the season of Lent. It happens before Easter. And uh, us working together to do a few things. I've come to the conviction that we as Christians we need to get together and, and start working together because the, the more we are apart, the more lost this community gets. And I think if we work together, we can get a whole lot more accomplished. So let's pray for revival in this community that will maybe add to the Baptist numbers, the Presbyterian numbers, the Methodist numbers, the Pentecostal numbers, and the non-denominational numbers. So that more people be reached by God, no matter who reaches them, uh, that they're reached. Let's let's pray. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Before you pray, I just want to remind everybody that Rhonda goes to the doctor on Wednesday to be um, checked to see if she will be able to withstand the radiation. And if, if she does, she'll start radiation on February the third. But the, the plastic surgeon has to approve her ready to do that. Yeah, she had a visit this past Wednesday for a mask. Is that, that right? She went to um, the Levine's Cancer Center and they made a mask that, that um, they put on her face in order to have the radiation. Protect the face from other parts that don't need the radiation, as you can say. Be in prayer for Rhonda and Barbara, most definitely. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you humbly, Lord. Um, we, we, bear, we bear a lot of burdens for those that are friends, loved ones, family members, church members, Lord, who are hurting, who physical ailments, Lord, who are sick in many ways, who are lost in a lot of cases, Lord. We lift them up to you. God, you know what needs to be done in these lives. We pray for healing, we pray for peace, we pray for strength, we pray for guidance. As we'll talk about here in a little bit, Lord, we don't know what the future holds. We often don't know what decisions to make to, to have a better future. But God, you know. You know our future. You know our future even before we were born, God. You know what decisions would be best, best for us to make. Guide us, Lord, guide our paths. We will keep our eyes on you. And we pray. rise for number 333, leaning on the everlasting arms. We're going to do the first two verses.
because it's doing it. Show us on this earth that we can trust more than you. Lord, now, we ask you to shift these ties and offerings and uh, ask you, Lord, that you would uh, use them to carry on your kingdom's work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
other members of our choir want to come and sing the Easter cantata, please come and see me. It's going to be a really beautiful cantata. We're doing Missouri on the Wonders Cross. It'll be a new work for you guys, and it's just beautiful. And I'm hoping some of you guys can find it in you that you want to sing. And uh, singing just by its nature is really joyous. And there's many health benefits as well. It's a good way to get together. Good fun. So come and join us. So if you can uh, make a joyful noise, I necessarily sing, make a joyful noise, come on out, right? Okay. So um, you better, you better, you bet. I've been on a rock and roll kick lately. The past few sermons we've referenced rock and roll music to start off the sermon. Uh, this song uh, was written by Pete Townsend, one of the great rock and roll guitar players, and he's infamous for breaking his guitars on stage and you know and causing a havoc and this song was released in 1981. I was a, a wee lad. Almost 20 years after the band formed in England. The song, uh, You Better, You Bet, has a catchy uh, it's a, it's a chorus essentially saying, You better love me. In fact, I'll read the chorus to you. When I say you love you, when I say I love you, you say you better. And then somebody repeats in the background, You better, you better, you bet. When I say I need you, you say you better. You better, you better, you bet. Essentially, what it is, the song is, is uh, respect between a man and a woman, and the woman saying, you better love me, you know what's best for you. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a cute little song, funny song in some ways, but uh, a lot of times we really don't know what's best, do we? We have to ask somebody to let us know what's best. Um, as y'all noticed, uh, I'm a little bright and shiny today. Uh, I'm allowed to dress myself, which is probably not the best move uh, when it comes to Sunday mornings. Uh, my wife, is, she... Uh, She's usually in the bed, and, and when I get dressed Sunday mornings, I pick my own clothes. And as y'all can tell, I don't make the best decisions, do I? It'd be better if you probably she dressed me. <laughs> no comment there. Okay, she shakes her head, rolls her eyes. Um, but we often don't know what's best for us, do we? We make decisions about our future, about life, and we try to weigh things out a little bit and try to make informed decisions. But when it comes to what next to do or what's good for our life, we often don't really know, do we? We as humans are flawed having a, a, a small snippet of perspective of life, but whether, whereas we don't know what's best for us, we often need somebody else to show us. And in this grand scheme of life, who better to show us what's best for us, the best decisions for us, than God Himself? You see, God knows what's best for us, and part of it's because He knows our future, and of course because He knows us. Even before we were formed in our mother's womb, God knew us. Knows the number of hairs on my head, and He's counting down every day, I think, as I lose hairs. But God knows us and knows what's best for us. In this passage we're going to look at today in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 10 and following, we'll skip around, uh, gives us some insight into what's best for our life. We can't know necessarily what's best, but we can follow the one who knows what's best for us? Who, the one and only good God. But this passage kind of begins with some two important questions. You know this little labyrinth maze up there. Life feels like a labyrinth and a maze sometimes, doesn't it? There's so many options of things to choose in life, places to go, things to do, uh, aspects of life we need to live. And sometimes we feel like we're trapped in a maze. We have no direction in life. Now this may be true for younger but even older adults may experience this as well. What next to do in life? What's the next step? There are two important questions to ask. In verse 12 of chapter 6, ask these questions. This is the New Living Translation. In the few days of our meaningless lives, remember Ecclesiastes is not very rosy, is he? The writer of Solomon, the Kohelet, the teacher, not very positive a lot of times. In the few days of our meaningless lives, who knows how our days can be best spent. Question number one. Our lives are like a shadow. Who can tell what will happen on this earth after we are gone? Question number two. So kind of to paraphrase these questions, who knows what's best for a person? Who knows what's good for a person in life? We often make decisions about what we think is what's best for us, but not often... Is that the case? We really know what's best. Who knows what will happen to, our, to us and our legacy in the future? 
We can only guess what's going to happen in the future to us. We can only guess what people will say about us once we're gone. You see, we can't see our future. We can't see or know what's best. We're not psychics, are we? You know, I'd like to think that my legacy one day will be a good legacy and people say good things about me. Uh, but they may not. I can't see the future. I don't know what decisions I'll make between now and the end of my life and post-life that will influence how others see me. In fact, I was joking around with Sherry Brown earlier. She saw my jacket and I said, it's for a sermon. She reminded me of the time the search committee came out and I preached with a tenfold hat on my head. Uh, and I said, that'll probably go on my headstone moment. She nodded yes. But she said, I didn't forget it, did I? I said, no, you didn't. You'll never let me forget it. But what decisions we make in life, even though our years may be fewer than they used to be, they affect our future. They affect our legacy. We can't always see crystal clear what's going to happen. You know, back in the uh, 90s, especially late 90s and early 2000s, there was this trend with these psychic hotlines. Uh, I remember being in college, guard the web, and, and you know, get home, get out of class, and flipping on TV, and you know, kind of veg out after class, and all these. Every five minutes, there was a commercial about this psychic hotline. Call now. And there was one Miss Cleo. You call, and she talked about the cards don't lie. She could tell you your future. Well, I found a clip from a TV show. This clip aired in November 17, 2001. It's a little bit of an irreverent show called Mad TV. It's a sketch comedy show. It, it makes uh, satirical jabs at culture. This uh, skit made a jab at Sister Cleo in the psychic hotline phenomenon. If I can get her to play.
the good, the bad, the happy, the sad. Matthew 5, 45 reminds us that God sends sunshine and rain on the good and evil both. And elsewhere, the Sermon on the Mount, we're reminded that He feeds the birds in the sky, close to the lilies of the field, and meets people's daily needs. God is good, provides for us. God knows what's best for us. He even sets out our destiny. That word in the New Living Translation is a, a bit of a commentator aspect of the translation of that word, but our future. He knows our future. Think about the future that God laid out before Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham, you know, to, to, you be, uh, if you'll I'll be your God, if you'll be my people type thing. And, and He laid out this whole future that eventually would lay out for redemption of all of humanity. Abraham was promised to be the father of many nations. That's a heck of a destiny. Even in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, we find out that God had a destiny for Jeremiah to make him a prophet even in the womb. God had a plan for him. And God has a plan for you. We all have a future. And God knows it. God set it out. God's laid it out and He allows us to make decisions and hopefully He shapes our path despite it. Except the way God does things. For who can straighten what He has made crooked? You see, God has set out the times and events of our lives, and we humans in many ways can't change it. God is in control. Even when we make bad decisions, God works despite us. Enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in this life. Chapter 7, verse 14. You see, God sends the rain on the the sunshine on the good and the bad, as Matthew 5 45 reminds us. Good things happen to good people, bad things happen to good people, good things happen to bad people, and bad things happen to bad people. We often don't know why. It could be because of our decisions we make about our future uh, in the moment. It could be because of God working His plan around us, in and around our lives. We don't know. We have a God who is powerful. So since we're not God, last time I checked, we're not God, how do we know what's best for us? How do we know what decisions to make in life? With our limited view of the good and the bad, how do we know what is good and what is bad? There's a few things to think about here in this passage. What is not good for a person in the future? There's a few things laid out here. This is not the whole spectrum of everything that's bad for us, but here are some things that in, in life that shapes our decisions in a bad way. First off, wealth. Remember 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Many people make bad decisions because of money, because of wealth, because of things, because of stuff. I'm often reminded of this notion of the curse of the lottery. You ever heard that? People that win uh, vast amounts of money, billions of dollars of lottery, and about a year later they're broke. There have been television specials and programs made on that. You know, I won a million dollars and everybody and their brothers now are related to me and needs money. People I didn't know ever existed claim they're my long lost cousin, need a thousand dollars. And people, <laughs> they see when a movie made about a situation happen. You know, more than 20 years ago, the uh, Lewis Fargo heist happened in this area where the, uh, the people uh, working the uh, armored car route stole a bunch of money. And one of the reasons why they were caught, because these people, they <laughs> made bad decisions based on money, bought big houses, things they couldn't afford on their salary, and exposed themselves. Money makes people do crazy things. Wealth influences our future in a negative way in a lot, of, a lot of cases. In fact, the Bible says a lot of bad things about wealth. In fact, there's a rich farmer in the Gospels who keeps building bigger bars and he's condemned for his wealth. The rich man, Lazarus, Lazarus is lifted up in that story and the rich man is condemned for his wealth and ignorance of God. James 5, uh, verses 1-6 through 6 talk about the oppression and, and greed of the rich. Luke 6, 24 says, Woe against the rich! But not all rich people are bad in the New Testament, mind you. Not all the rich are condemned. There's a rich man from Arimathea. <coughs> Excuse me. 
rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who provides a tomb for Jesus. And Nicodemus provides a lavish burial for Jesus. And he was a ruler of the Jews in, God, in John's Gospel. So wealth is something that can negatively influence our decisions and our future in a bad way. Things that we are to avoid uh, to be blinded by. But another thing is pleasure, too. We live in a society of instant gratification, don't we? We want things, we want them now. I like to call it uh, the Burger King Society. And I've mentioned this before. I had a teacher in eighth grade had a sign up on his board uh, uh, said, this isn't Burger King, you can't have it your way. And that's how he ran his classroom. He was pretty strict. But we live in a society where we want it like Burger King, we want our life with this, this, and this, and we want it now. And Burger King, you order your Whopper with this, without onions and tomatoes and whatever you want on it, and have it quickly. You see people move from hit to hit looking for what makes them feel good or better. Seeking pleasure in this life. But we're told that the pleasures of this life are fleeting. In fact, we're told to flee from the things of this world. John 15, 19 says, If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to this world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You are to be separate from this world, not fulfilled by the instant gratification of this world. Speaking of instant gratification, speaking of the Burger King Society we live in, I found this cute little clip I want to show you. And uh, we'll talk about it in a second after the clip. Gentleman who uh, 
was a brother-in-law of one of our deacons, went to the funeral, or to the receiving, excuse me. And the receiving was supposed to be for like a two-hour receiving. Receiving ended up being about a three or four-hour receiving because people were lined up, lined up to pay their respects to this man who was such a good man, had such a good reputation in society. Maybe one of these days when I'm long gone, or, I, or one of these days when I'm, I'm, they're having a receiving for me, there'll be people lined up to talk about me because I lived the right way, lived a godly life, and followed God, had a good reputation. I don't know. Maybe it's my hubris wanting that. But a good reputation is important. As Ecclesiastes 7 1 says, a good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. How do people perceive you? You have a good reputation. But how you burned your bridges? A lot of people have done that. Another trait that we can have that sets us on the right path of knowing what's good for our future, humility. Humility is the proper attitude of human beings toward their Creator. Humility is grateful and spontaneous awareness of the, the life, that life is a gift. That we're dependent upon God. See, humility is the opposite of this me culture that we live in. This instant gratification, self-loving culture. If I kind of put it in 21st century terms, it's Instagram, pictures of myself culture. Humility is the opposite of that. It realizes that we're small in the grand scheme of things. That God is big and we're small. That's humility in a nutshell. Openness to instruction is another one of these characteristics. And that kind of plays part and parcel of humility. But openness to be molded by God, shaped by God. To allow God to work in our lives. To instruct us in the ways that we may go. But, you know, the opposite of that is being stubborn, isn't it? Trying to buck up against God, kick against the pricks, if you will. If I use some language with Paul and his call on the road to Damascus. There's a lot of people in this society that aren't open to God's instruction. When, when teachable moments come in life and maybe God speaks in that still small voice to the Holy Spirit, they don't listen. Because they're too enamored with the me and the I. Another characteristic that's good, that's important, is patience. <laughs> As I've mentioned to y'all before, uh, I'm not very patient. Pray for patience before and God put me in rush hour traffic on 85 in Charlotte. Uh, yeah, God, you know, you pray for something, God's gonna get you, God's gonna get you there. It may not be the way you want to. But patience is really important. Biblical patience is God exercised and God given. It's, it's restraint in the face of opposition or oppression. It's not passivity. It's being displayed on God's time and God's instruction. You notice these characteristics, good reputation, humility, openness to instruction, patience. It takes the focus off of us and puts the focus on Him. The one who truly knows what's best for our life. The one who truly can guide our lives for the best. Who knows what's good for us. Who knows what's best. You see, since we're not God and we don't know what's best for our future, what can we do? What can we do in this life to be attuned to God's will, to, to follow His leading? We'll just seek Him daily. Seek the Almighty daily. Through prayer, through scriptural reading, through meditation, if you will. Seeking God daily. God, what do you want me to do today? How can I follow you best today, God? Every decision in the back of your mind, consulting, saying, Holy Spirit, what should I do? Instead of saying, I know. Say, God, what do you know? <clears throat> Another way, live like it. Emulate it. Be patient. Be humble. Have a good reputation. You know, it's not easy to know what's best for our future. It's not easy to make the best decisions of what's going to be good for us one day. You know, and, and whether that uh, the reputation we have after our life is, is closer than others, what we can do is follow Him. And as I'm often reminded, you know, 
The book of Ecclesiastes points to the fact that we are small. We're dust in the wind, as we talked about last Sunday. But we serve an Almighty God. Trust in Him. In all your decisions and all the decisions of life and, and, and the desire to maybe have a good reputation, trust in Him. If you follow Him, you'll do well. The man I talked about that went to the receiving and lasted several hours past what he was supposed to, it wasn't that he tried his best to have a popularity contest amongst other people. He just followed God. And everything else fell into place. He was a godly man. People respected that. His reputation was good, not because he tried then to make his reputation good. It was good because he followed God. That's how God wanted to live. Live a life that seeks the Almighty. And live a life that emulates Him. That's how we do what's best for our life. As we sing. Can we please all rise for number 550, I'd Rather Have Jesus.
What would Jesus do in decisions they would make? What would Jesus do about this path in the road, the left or the right forward? What would Jesus do? In many ways, no matter where we are in life, we still need to ask that question. What would Jesus do? What, what would God have us do? Sometimes they ask the Holy Spirit, say, Holy Spirit, lead me which way I should go. Because it has ramifications on our reputation, it has ramifications on who we influence in our life, the negative or, or positive. Let's follow Him. If we follow Him, things will fall into place. Uh, we have a moment of conference. You may be seated. If, you, if you'd like to leave, you may feel free to do so.